you can kind of tell that Luke is a doctor because he's he's long-winded on a lot of things, isn't he? He's Luke Luke nine has uh, let's see here sixty-two verses. Today we're going to cover forty-six and following, but uh, lots of information. <clears throat> The events that we've already been looking at here in Luke 9 are very, very important to understanding the verses that we are going to be looking at today. Context matters in scripture study. Context matters in everything, really. It matters in conversation. It matters in Bible study. And the immediate context of what we're going to look at, I, I, I'm kind of hopeful that as we're, we're going through this, I was talking with with Steph last night about, about what we're going to be looking at this morning. I hope that when we get to, to the meat of the passage that we're going to be looking at today, I hope you have the uh, allow the natural feelings that you would have if you were a parent, maybe, to, to take over as we're reading about what's going on with Jesus and with the apostles. But the context is important because everything that has come before in Luke, the entire book, but especially in Luke 9, very much plays into what we're going to be looking at today. In Luke 1, I'm sorry, in Luke 9, verses 1 to 9, Jesus empowered the apostles, okay? And you can look back and, and you can see Jesus empowered the apostles and he sent them out to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God to a select group. What group? Only to the Jews, okay? This was, this was I, I refer to this as the little commission. The great commission is take the gospel to every creature. This was kind of a dry run, kind of a prototype of the great commission. Jesus empowered the disciples and sent them out to give the gospel just to the, just to the Jews. Now, the gospel's for all men, whosoever will, as we just sang. But in this case, Jesus had a point in what he was doing. That's verses 1 through 9. Verses 10 through 17, Jesus fed the multitude. How many men were there? 5,000. And that's why we call it the feeding of the 5,000. If, if we can deduce anything from the average family of that day, likely we're talking between 15 and 20,000 people that Jesus fed with one little boy's lunch. It was five loaves and two fish, and Jesus fed... 15, 20,000 people, meaning that Jesus made an awful lot of food out of essentially nothing. Jesus could have just as easily fed them without the little boy's lunch, but kind of an encouraging thing that we can take a little bit, give it to the Lord, and he can multiply it. Gives me, gives me hope. Verses 18 to 22, right after the feeding of the multitude, Jesus asked the disciples, who do, the men, who do people say that I am? They said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, some Elijah, some of the prophets, and Jesus said, well, who do you say that I am? Peter said, you're the Christ of God. You're the promised Messiah. And Jesus confirmed that. Jesus said, you're right, essentially. Now, I'm very much paraphrasing, but Jesus says, you're right. I am the Messiah. I am the promised one. What you have thought to be true is now confirmed. Verses 23 through 27, Jesus explains what is required to be a true disciple. There were three things, and we went over these. To be a true, you want to be a true Christ follower, you need to deny, deny yourself, you need to take up your cross, and you need to follow him. And we, we laid that out, so I'm not going to re-preach that passage. Verses 28 to 36, Jesus is transfigured before the eyes of Peter, James, and John. On the Mount of Transfiguration, remember, they look at Jesus and he's, he's shining. The Bible says that he's glistering, which means that clothed in lightning. Jesus is standing there clothed in bright light, and he's talking to, to Elijah, and he's talking to Moses. And, and Peter, James, and John got to look at it and, and the whole situation that happened there. Last week, we looked at verse 37 to verse 45. The disciples were unable to cast a demon out of a young boy. Jesus, Peter, James, and John were coming down out of the mountain, and they were met by a father in distress. He said, my son, he's got a medical condition, and he's, he's got a demon that has possessed him. I went to your disciples, and your disciples couldn't cast him out. 
help me. That we, and we looked at that last week. That was the man who said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Lots of application there. A critical change has taken place in the events of Luke 9. When Jesus asked the disciples, who do, who do you say that I am? And they said, you're the Christ. We know from Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. So a transition has taken place. Before the events of Luke 9, Jesus gave general teaching. After Luke 9, Jesus is giving very pointed teaching as it relates to the cross. He says to the disciples again and again and again, I'm going to be taken. I'm going to die. And he even tells them, I'm going to rise again on the third day. But they just whew, right over their heads. They don't get it. And, and we'll see even today. They just don't get it. They don't understand the whole principle, the whole concept of the Messiah. The shadow of the cross will fall across almost all of Jesus' teaching for the, for the apostles, anyway, in the next 18 months, which is about what it is from this point in our study until Jesus will die on the cross. It's bewildering to us that the disciples could still struggle with just who Jesus was and what his mission was because he said, I am. The, the Messiah. He, he laid it out for him. I remember when I was, when I was younger and, and even, even later in my life as I was reading, I was like, well, well, why didn't Jesus just come out and say it? Why didn't Jesus just come out and say, look, I am the Son of God and I've come for the... You know what? He, he did. And they just didn't get it. You, we'll look at it later. When, when he's in the upper room, they missed a lot of things. Jesus... They were asking, who's going to betray him? Who's going to betray him? Jesus said, whoever I hand this piece of bread to is the one who's going to betray me. They said, who's going to betray him? Who's going to betray him? He handed it to Judas. And they all said, who's going to betray him? You, you think, wow, they're, they're kind of dense a little bit. You, you ever been like that when it comes to biblical truth? I have. You, you're, I've read that passage I don't know how many times. It seems like the truth just kind of continually <coughs> over my head. Or, or it bangs into my head. I'm kind of hard-headed sometimes. But, but the disciples, we, we look at them and we're bewildered. How, how could you be this blind? How do you not get it? Jesus, I mean, he did spell it out. Even in this chapter, where they've repeatedly heard the truth, there still seems to be a mental block of some kind that keeps them from realizing the magnitude of Jesus' mission to redeem mankind. They just, it's not... There's a, there's a failure to communicate between what Jesus is saying and their reception of it. We learn in verse 45 that theirs was almost a willful ignorance. They were pretty happy in their ignorance, and they were actually scared to ask Jesus about it. In verse 45 of Luke 9, it says, But they understood not this said, and it was hid from them, that they perceived it not. And they feared to ask him of that said. Well, we're... We don't know what Jesus is talking about, but we're pretty sure we don't want to know what he's talking about. Because it doesn't sound nice. Jesus was talking about his suffering and his dying. This would be when you're, when you're sitting in the doctor's office and the doctor comes in and he has bad news. And he shares the bad news, but he uses big doctor words. And you decide, you know what? I'm good not knowing what those words mean. I, I, don't, I don't need to ask questions. And, and you just leave. The disciples... They, they know that they don't like what Jesus is saying, but they don't understand, and they're not going to ask. Instead of asking what Jesus is saying, they're going to argue over greatness here in verse 46. Then there arose a reasoning among them, which of them should be greatest? The word reasoning is the word dialogismos, from which we get our English word dialogue. And it means discussion, debate, argument. Think discussion like what you told your kids you were having with your spouse when you, you remember. No, we're not arguing. We're just having a discussion, okay? They're having a discussion amongst themselves, okay? They're, 
And, and, and this, this, again, think of this as a parent, okay? Think of this as someone who has little children or maybe grandchildren. Kind of throw this into that light. On the heels of Jesus speaking about his impending death, Jesus says, I'm going to be taken. I'm going to die. I'm going to be taken by the, the religious leaders in Jerusalem, and I'm going to die. They begin arguing about who's the greatest. On the heels of Jesus saying, I'm going to die, they're arguing about who's going to be greatest. The, an illustration of this, think, think of your, your, the, the family's been called to the deathbed of a beloved parent. And while, the, while they stand there at the deathbed of this beloved parent, they start arguing about who mom liked best. That's kind of tone deaf, just a little bit. Right? Jesus just shared, I'm going to be taken. I'm going to die. And they said, I'm going to be bigger than you in the kingdom. What? What? There's a level of immaturity here that I don't want to be lost on you. Okay? Because we do it too. Okay? That's why I don't want it to be lost, because this is where we live, too. This only underscores that the disciples didn't understand Jesus' mission. They assumed that the kingdom would be happening soon. They assumed that they would be given their, their proper place of authority. Jesus is, well, Jesus is here. They now know. Jesus has told us he's the Messiah. And, and soon he's going to kick Rome out, and he'll, you know, he'll probably give us kingdoms. He'll, mine will probably be bigger than yours. Peter, and, uh, and, and th that's how they're talking, because they assume Jesus is going to establish the kingdom soon. Th this, isn't, this isn't way in the future. Incidentally, Jesus still hasn't established his earthly kingdom 2,000 years later, okay? So they missed it by a lot, okay? And they missed everything that was going to happen in between, but they don't understand the cross, they don't understand the resurrection. They wouldn't understand the resurrection until they were looking at Jesus. They don't understand the great commission that would be given to them. They don't understand the, the 2,000 years of church history in which we live. All of that was lost on the disciples. And I want you to, just for a moment, imagine Jesus' feelings as he watches these 12 grown men who will soon be the backbone of the church. In 18 months, Jesus is going to die. He's going to rise from the dead, and then he's going to ascend back to the Father. And he's watching these, these 12. At that point, there would be 11. Jesus is watching 11 grown men arguing amongst themselves about a kingdom that they don't even understand. Do you think on a human level, would there be a level of frustration? As you watch these 12 grown men, you think... There's not a lot of time to whip these guys into shape. From a human perspective, that's what we would think. Oh, I, really? This is what we're going to build the church? The, the, these are the guys who are going to be the, the foundation of the church? Oh, and they're, argue, they're arguing amongst themselves about who's going to be greatest in the kingdom. The kingdom that, that they'll all die before they see in reality as they would as they will one day. The disciples have chosen this moment to put on this prideful display. James chapter 4 verse 6 says, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. This is restated in, in 1 Peter 5, 5, that God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. And there is pride oozing out all over this conversation as they're jockeying for a higher position in a kingdom they don't even understand. Enlisting the things that God hates in Proverbs 6, 16, we read these six things that the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination to him. Number one on the list, a proud look. Since the disciples are obviously comparing themselves to they're not comparing themselves to Jesus. They're comparing themselves amongst themselves. Peter looks at John and says, I'm, I'm a little bit older than you. I'm more qualified. I'll probably have a bigger, a bigger kingdom of, of my own in the kingdom. And, and Andrew, you know, Andrew, he, well, you know, Peter's my brother, and I'll probably have a pretty decent-sized plot of land myself. 
Then you have Simon and, and, and Levi. Do you figure that a zealot and a tax collector ever had anything to say to each other? They're probably going at it too. And all of this pride, as they're comparing themselves amongst themselves, which we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves amongst themselves are not wise. Okay. But they're doing it. They're, they're manifesting pride and a lack of wisdom, a lack of discretion, all sorts of problems that is just, it's just bubbling to the surface as the disciples are arguing over who's the greatest. And Jesus gives some omniscient insight here in verse 47. We read the first part of the verse. Notice what it says and what it doesn't say. Verse 47 says, and Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart. Notice that it doesn't say Jesus hearing what they said. Jesus heard the thoughts of their heart. He perceived the thoughts of their heart. Now, most adults, it's typically a sign of maturity that adults have kind of a, a censor or a governor on the things that they say. How many of you say everything you think? Don't, okay? Good way to lose friends, okay? They, they have probably, as adults, they have a governor. If they're actually using their voices to argue about who's greatest in the kingdom, what do you think they were thinking? How much more pride, how much crazier thoughts were actually bouncing around in their heads? And Jesus knows not just what they're saying, though he does. He knows even what they're thinking. Jesus not only heard and was concerned with what they were saying, but also with the thought process, the arrogance that was behind their conversation. The word thought here in verse 47 is the same word as the word that we, we mentioned earlier uh, about reasoning in verse 46. They were dialoguing, they were discussing in, in their hearts. They were, they were putting one another down and lifting one another up and ranking one another in their hearts, and they had allowed some of it to even seep out of, of their mouth at this point. Mark chapter 9 gives us more insight into the actual events. It says in Mark 9, 33, And he came to Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked them, What was it that ye disputed among yourselves, by the way? Oh, they, they were talking. They didn't know that Jesus heard, but Jesus, he knew their thoughts. He actually overheard their conversation. What was it that ye discussed among yourselves, by the way? Verse 34 tells us, but they held their peace, for by the way, they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. Kind of like a, a kid with their hand caught in the cookie jar. Whoa, what are you doing? Oh, well, we were, <clears throat> we were divvying up the world. Because, you know, Peter wants to rule this part, and I wanted to rule this part, and we figured that you'd give it. Really? These are the, the men who Jesus is going to... to to hand a lot to here very soon. And I bet they even realize that Jesus knows the answer. You ever done that as a parent? Ask your kid a question that you already know the answer to? All the time, right? Jesus says, what were you talking about on the way? And it had to dawn on Peter, James, John. You know, he knows what we were talking about, by the way. But their embarrassment over their jockeying for position was overpowered by their arrogance because in Matthew chapter 18, verse 1, another parallel passage, they actually asked Jesus to settle the discussion. It, it says, at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They, they actually put it in words and, and phrased it as a question to Jesus. So, Jesus, which one of us is going to get more, Peter or me? Which, which one of us is the greatest in the kingdom? Could, could you give us a ranking of how we're doing? Whew. Wow. Jesus is long-suffering with them, as he is with us. Aren't you thankful? Verse 47, Jesus perceived the thought of their heart, took a child, and set him by him, and said unto them, Whosoever shall receive this child in my name receiveth me, and whoever shall receive me receiveth him that sent me. For he that is least among you, all the same shall be great. Ever gracious and long-suffering with his disciples. And this is a manifestation of Christ's long-suffering. Because as, as a human, we would kind of snap. We'd get short with them. We'd be, we'd be snarky in our response to the disciples. This, their arrogance 
But Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus is long-suffering. Mark 9 tells us, And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, I remember when I was very, very small, reading this passage or hearing it read and imagining, could you imagine being the child that Jesus picked up and held for an object lesson? Wow, that, that, that would be an amazing thing. But Jesus is holding a child. They're in Capernaum. We don't know. Peter, may, Peter lived in Capernaum. We know Peter was married. Maybe it's one of Peter's children. We don't know. There's an intrinsic humility in a child in this day especially. Daryl L. Bach, a commentator, says, In Judaism, children under 12 could not be taught the Torah, and so to spend time with them was considered a waste. Well, they, don't, they obviously don't have anything of value to say. They don't understand the Torah, so they would just be kind of set aside until they reached that age. But Jesus picks this one up, and he, he makes him an object lesson. We don't know anything about this child. Again, we, we could surmise, maybe it's Peter's, but ultimately we don't know. We don't know his name. We don't know if it's a he. Could have been, could have been a girl. Don't know the age. Don't know the grades of this child in, the, in school. We don't know their behavior that day. We know nothing about this child. Jesus chose a random child to illustrate the point that you can learn much about how a person treats the least of how do, you, how do you treat the least significant? How do you treat the, the ones who... Re what, what could a child do for Jesus? Nothing. Nothing that he couldn't do for himself. And yet he says that he who receives a child receives me. I want you to turn, keep your finger here in Luke 9, and turn to Matthew 18. It's going to give us a little bit more information because Luke is, is kind of short in this dialogue here. Matthew 18 is a parallel passage, and we're going to start reading in verse 3. <clears throat> Jesus is speaking, and he said, he's holding this child, and he said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye, can, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Oh, well, that kind of stands everything that they've been talking about on its head. Whoever humbles themselves, they'll be the greatest. Oh. Oh, well. Forget everything we just said, right? Kind of, kind of the mentality. Verse 5, Matthew 18. And whosoever shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But whosoever shall offend one of these little ones which believes in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Jesus praises the faith of children. Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Can, can a small child trust Jesus as personal Savior? Absolutely. They're the standard. They're the standard of, of faith. Their faith is often of a more pure kind than that of adults. We, we were talking about this at the Waymar Bible study this past Thursday. If you, want, if you want to get a hold of God, ask a child to pray for you. Why? Because children, they just they don't know any better than just to believe that God hears them. Amen. And a little child will walk right into the presence of God and they'll ask for they'll ask for anything and have absolute confidence. Well, of course God's going to do it. I asked him for it. Kind of like a, a child with a parent. They come in, come into the presence of their parent, and they ask for they ask for something, and they assume, well, because I asked, of course I was heard. Of course I'll 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 I'll, I'll receive an answer. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. He says, look, unless you have the faith of a child, unless you have that simple faith, the problem with adult faith is that we often overcomplicate things. We add in all of this stuff. Where a child, if you tell a child, if you pray and you ask Jesus Christ to save you from your sins and come into your heart, he'll do it. And a child will say, I want to do that. And they'll do it. Where you say that to an adult and they say, there's got to be a catch. There's got to be something more that I've got to do. What, what do I have to do? I understand, I understand Jesus will do everything, but what do I have to do? 
As adults, we overcomplicate things. But Jesus says the faith of children is where it's at. When God says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, childlike faith says, I know how to be saved. I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And they are. Verse 6 here of Matthew 18 is a truth that should be carefully examined by those who are producing our school curriculum in 2021, but it goes beyond that. It says, but whosoever shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Does God like children? Yes. You want to get on his bad side? <laughs> offend children. God takes it seriously. I mean, this, this is just straightforward application. God takes seriously those who, who offend children. And offending meaning everything that, that we understand it to mean in our society. But beyond the obvious meaning regarding the offense of children, what had the disciples been arguing about? Who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? Jesus tells his disciples, who've been arguing, likely trying to assert dominance over each other, that they have to avoid giving offense to the least among them. So, the way that they rank them, how, how do you figure they rank the disciples? Well, all of them would rank them differently. If you ask Bartholomew where to, to rank the disciples, most people would put themselves at the top, right? Well, there's me, and then there's... And if you ask Peter to rank the disciples, well, there's, there's me, and then... And everybody looks a little bit different. But regardless of how they rank them, Jesus says, the least among you, you, you need to watch how you treat them. Because God cares how we treat the least. He uses a child to illustrate it. They've been jockeying for number one position, and Jesus tells them that the most important thing is how they treat the least. How do, you, how do you treat the one in number 12 slot of, of the apostles? How do, how do you deal with them? That says an awful lot about you. Somebody said once that the, the sign of a truly great man or woman is how they treat people they don't need. And that's true. The least of these. The paradox of Christianity is revealed here in this. The paradox being something that is true but seems like it's not true. Philippians chapter 2 verse 3 says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. And look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Matthew 20 verse 26 says, But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. The way to the top is down for believers. You, you, want, to, you, want, to, you want to be the number one ruler in the kingdom? Then serve everyone. You, you seek the lowest position. Jesus himself provided our greatest example in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. You know the passage says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Jesus, who's, who's number one in the kingdom? Peter, James, John? Jesus is number one in the kingdom. And Jesus made himself a servant. God in the flesh. And he came as a servant. Many think about what they would do if they only had 24 hours left to live. What, what would you eat? It's usually where I start. If I only had 24 hours, what would I eat? If I, if I was running out of time, well... There'd be a lot of ice cream. I can tell you that. That's one thing that I would have. We, we think what we would do if we, well, I'd, I'd go skydiving. I'd, I'd do, I'd, I'd visit family. I'd, I'd, I'd eat such and such. And I'd eat lots of it because that wouldn't matter. We have all of these thoughts. What we would do, you got 24 hours. When Jesus knew that he had 24 hours before the crucifixion, you know what he did? Prayed. He prayed and he washed feet. That's humility. Jesus knew he, 
Within 24 hours, he would be hanging on an old rugged cross outside of Jerusalem. With, with 24 hours, and he knows, Jesus girded himself with a towel and washed Judas Iscariot's feet and Peter's feet. And all of these men who were jockeying for position. He who would be chiefest among them, let him be the servant of all. But then we come to, it, it almost seems disjointed, but it's not. John's admission here in verse 49 and 50. And John answered and said, so it's part of this conversation. John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him, because he followed not with us. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. Now there's a lot of, of things that can be said out of this passage. Let's, let's try to get exactly what it means, and we can make application in addition to it. We don't have the actual event where John and the disciples saw this man casting out demons. We don't have that recorded for us, just John's recollection. We saw one casting out demons in your name, and, and he, he's not one of us, so we told him to stop. Apparently, this unnamed man was successfully casting out demons. Can you imagine why this would be embarrassing for the disciples? Look at verse 40 of chapter 9. Can you imagine why it would be embarrassing? Because they tried. They, they were trying to cast out demons, and they couldn't get it done. And here's this unnamed nobody who he was out there casting out demons in Jesus' name. So we told him to stop. Enough of that. The problem with this unnamed man, the problem, there was no problem. Okay, But the problem that they saw, he's, he's, not, he's not one of us, Lord. So we told him to stop. Only, the only way that we know that the man was casting out demons properly is it worked. Okay? Because it doesn't always work. Okay? We know in Acts chapter 19, do you remember the story? There was a man named Sceva who had seven sons. And they decided that they were going to go try to cast out demons. Because they saw Paul doing it. They thought that looked really cool. So they were going to go cast out demons too. So they went out and found a demon-possessed name. And said, in the name of Jesus whom Paul serves, come out. And the, the demon said, the demons responded to these seven misled uh, exorcists. He said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? And the demon-possessed man beat them all, stripped them all, and sent them out naked and bleeding. Okay, so this doesn't work if, if done improperly. But this man, apparently, he was, he understood who Jesus was. We don't, wouldn't you love to know who this was? We don't know. But, but this man, apparently, understood, had faith, and went out and cast out demons in the name of Jesus. Something that even the disciples had struggled to do, even in this chapter. says that they, they told him to stop. They forbade him. The Greek word means to hinder, to keep, or to suffer. It's a connotative word in the Greek language, which means they tried to forbid him, but he didn't listen. Okay? So the twelve came and said, you need to stop. And the man kept right on going, and he didn't listen to them. Jesus said, forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. The disciples were promoting exclusivity, driven by pride. You can't cast out devils. You're not one of us. You, you can't do this. John may have thought he was defending Jesus' reputation. You can't just go out there and use the name of Jesus to cast out demons when you're not one of us. Jesus, so notice this, the, the disciples promote exclusivity based on pride. Jesus promotes unity based on truth. That's still going on today. Pride and exclusivity or truth and unity. If the man had been a false teacher, you think Jesus would have allowed the disciples to forbid him to go on? If this man was out there and he wasn't doing it in Jesus' name? If, yeah, Jesus, Jesus didn't promote false teaching. But this man, he said, leave him alone. He who's not against us is for us. Truth governs 
unity. Unity does not govern truth. Let me say that again because it's important, especially in 2001 or 2021. Unity does not govern truth. Truth governs unity. Who can we join hands with? Those who agree on truth. If you don't agree on truth, then we can't join hands. Okay? Those who are not who are not against us are for us. And there are a lot of people who say, well, if they're not actively out there teaching that Jesus isn't the Son of God, then we should join hands with them. No, not necessarily, because there's a lot of truth that we need to make the test of unity. But unity can happen when there is truth. And in this case, there was. There's no middle ground between truth and error. Jesus says, he that is not against us is for us. I mean, you're, you're, not, you're not sort of on, on the right side. You're not sort of doing right. You're either doing right or you're doing wrong. Far from being a call to erase the lines of doctrinal difference and join hands with everybody who, quote, loves Jesus, as we hear the calls to do an awful lot today, this should be viewed as a warning. He who's not for us, he who's not against us is, is for us. And in another passage, he gives the negative. That he who's, not, uh, uh, he who's not for us is against us. I can rejoice when the gospel is proclaimed by somebody with whom I disagree. And so could the Apostle Paul. I have, I have read very good gospel presentations on the websites of ministries that I, I wouldn't go to. I, that I wouldn't, I wouldn't, if, if, if that famous preacher came to town, I wouldn't go hear it. Okay? But he preaches the gospel. I can rejoice in the gospel going out, and I should, because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 15, the apostle Paul faced a situation where there were people, get this, they were trying to hurt Paul by preaching the gospel. Okay? Listen to this. Philippians 1.15 says, Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of content contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I'm set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding, every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. There were people, Paul was in prison when he's writing Philippians, there were people who thought, we'll make Paul extra miserable if we go preach the gospel while he's in prison. Because he'll, he'll feel like he can't do it, but we can. So this will be a good way to get Paul. You, really? You're going to hurt Paul's feelings by preaching the gospel? He says, yes, I rejoice. You go preach the gospel, you're not going to hurt my feelings. I don't agree with you. That's fine. You're preaching the gospel, have at it. Hurt my feelings as bad as you want. Preach the gospel to everybody would have been Paul's mentality. And, and here, as it relates to this, we should rejoice in the, in the spreading of the gospel. Where there are gospel preaching ministries, we should rejoice that the gospel goes forth. Sometimes I'm convinced that the power of the gospel is... is we know that that's why people get saved. They're not saved because it's a, a good ministry. They're not saved because the person has all of their doctrine right. We're, they're saved because that person has presented the gospel. And the gospel, not that person, is the power of God unto salvation. And so I can rejoice. I don't agree with them. If they were preaching across the street, I wouldn't walk across to hear them. But I can rejoice that the gospel goes forth. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Ultimately, this unnamed man was doing the work of God in the name of Jesus, and thus he wasn't stopped. Jesus said, no, leave him alone because he who's not against us is for us. God is not a sectarian. God doesn't, doesn't divide everybody into sects. We do, but God doesn't. Where there's error, there should be separation. But where there's truth, there can and there should be unity. Nothing more and nothing less than this. So, let's, let's get the application here, okay? 
Don't, don't pack up and go home just yet. Let's get the application from these few verses. Number one, pride is not a virtue. We discussed this briefly on Wednesday evening. Uh, but pride is not a virtue. It's the source of all sin. Here the disciples, why would they be trying to jockey for a number one position in the kingdom? Pride. I'm better than him. Of course. Of course I should run the kingdom. Have you seen how Andrew keeps the checks? Have you seen how he, how he preserves the food? Of course I'll be over him in the kingdom. It's pride. And it stunk then and it stinks now. It's not, a, it's not a virtue. But it's easy for us to look at the disciples standing in the presence of Jesus, having witnessed his miracles and heard his teaching, and give them a hard time for this. It really would. We Again, in the context of all that they've seen, just in chapter 9, you'd say, guys, get it together. You know better. But we have the completed scripture. We have the Holy Spirit living inside. And I still struggle with pride. And, and I know you do too because we're all made out of the same stuff. We struggle with pride. Desire for position. And recognition is dangerous. Well, I just, I just want to make sure everybody knows how I'm ministering. I just want to make sure that everybody notices how spiritual I am. You're, you're losing. <laughs> you, you, you missed it. James chapter 4, verse 6, again. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. God's looking for humble servants. Who, who, will, be, who will be greatest in the kingdom of God? Well, we've all got all these names. You could say, well, it's going to be so-and-so. He's preached millions. Well, it's going to be, it's going to be this, this person because whew, they had such an amazing ministry. Again, touched millions of lives. Who's going to be greatest in the kingdom of God? I don't know. And you don't either. Somebody likely who we've never heard of who was a servant of everyone. Who they live to serve the greatest in the kingdom of God. Number two, the mark of true spiritual maturity is shown in how we treat the least among us. When we realize that the way up in God's economy is actually down, we'll value service over authority. There's a reason why in the epistles we read, be not many masters, knowing we shall receive the greater condemnation. When, when you, you say, I, I just, if I had authority, I could minister better. If you're not ministering where you're at, then you wouldn't minister with more. That's, that's just a fact. Mm -hmm. And number three, make sure that truth governs unity, not the other way around. When unity overrides truth, that's when we say, well, we can join hands with anybody. We, we, we give them a litmus that, we, is Jesus God? Yes. Then we can join hands. No, there's more truth. We, we need to make this the source of our unity. D do we agree on, on doctrine? Do we agree on scripture? Then we can unify and we can press forward together. If, if we don't agree, if you're preaching the gospel, way to go. I, I'm praying that people are saved, but I'm, I'm not going to join with you. But, but this truth is the governor of, your, of unity. Rejoice in the gospel going forth, as long as it's the true gospel, even if it's not exactly how you do it. I have seen people who have very different methods of preaching the gospel. I've seen people with sandwich boards. Have you ever seen this? People go out and they have a they have a sandwich board and it says turn or burn or something on it. You know, and you you, you think, oh, really? We're we're doing this? And and they've got a track and it's got a it's got a picture on the front of it, and it, you, you think, well, that's that's a little bit offensive, but but you know what? They're giving the gospel. It's certainly not how I would do it, but they're giving the gospel. Are, are, are you giving the gospel? Am I giving the gospel? They, they, they're out there wearing a sandwich board, handing out handing out tracts. It's not how I would do it, but at least they're at least they're giving the gospel. And I, in that, I can rejoice. When I talk to the person and and I discover that they're they're way off on some things, I can at least rejoice in the gospel going forward. I don't I don't have to rejoice. I don't have to agree with them that the earth is flat. I just have to. I have to rejoice that they're spreading the gospel. 
because he that's not against us is for us. Jesus says, allow truth to govern unity, not unity to govern truth. Let's bow for a word of prayer here this morning. In just a few verses, we've covered an awful lot of, of territory here this morning. Maybe this morning God's dealt with you on this matter of pride. And you're, you're struggling. You say, you know what? It's, I know we all struggle with pride, but I'm, I'm having an especially hard time with it right now. Maybe you're, you're struggling with this principle of making sure that unity doesn't con control truth, but that truth controls unity. Maybe you've been trying to erase lines that God put down in his word. Whatever God bids you do this morning in your heart, I would, I would ask you to do business with God. In just a moment, we're going to pray. We'll sing a song of an invitation, give you some time to talk to the Lord this morning. Our Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us. Lord, we thank you for your long suffering. Lord, we, we look at what the disciples did, and, and Lord, it's easy for us to point fingers and to to think, how could they be so foolish? But Lord, just as we do that, we know that we manifest these same problems ourselves many times. I pray that we would be found faithful, that we would be servants of all. Lord, that we would, would mind how we treat the least among us. And Lord, that we would, would rejoice in the spreading of the gospel and still hold truth as our standard. Pray that you would get honor and glory out of our lives and all that's said and done in Jesus' name. Amen.